my thought process was we spent two weeks on ultrasound and our family and our friends who know nothing about medicine are going to be like, oh, so you know all about babies. So I was like, okay, I want to like learn a little bit about that. So if anyone asks, like I at least have some knowledge. So my goal is to kind of pass on to you essentially a crash course of the POCUS 101 information and then a couple other things. But yeah, I'm going to go as fast as possible. So bear with me. So there's two ways to do um, OB ultrasounds, either transabdominal or transvaginal. Um, transabdominal is just kind of like what we've been doing. I mean, very similar using usually the curvilinear phase or curvilinear probe. You can also use phase array, but curvilinear is usually used because it goes deeper. So it gives you higher resolution. resolution. Um, if you do this transabdominal approach in the first trimester, you want a full bladder so that it's the, um, the, oh my goodness, what is that called? Acoustic window. Um, it like helps with the ultrasound waves. And then you want your patient supine. You want them on their back um, or like leaned back at least a little bit. That helps to kind of relax the abdomen, keep the knees or like bend their knees. And that also helps with that. There is usually an OB setting um, on the machine and then the indicator as always to the head or to the right. Okay, transvaginal, um, we haven't really talked about this at all, but it has its uh, own special probe and it's called an endocavitary probe. It, you can see it right there. Um, the actual like probe part is just the very tip. And then on the other side is the handle and the indicator is, you can't see it from here. It'd be what's on the back, but it goes on the top um, when it goes in or to the right. Uh, and then, it's sterile, so you need sterile gel and some kind of sterile probe cover. Usually, or often, they'll use like a glove or like a sterile condom um, to be able to keep that sterility. If this is ideal for first trimester um, because you get to be, you know, so close to those actual structures, and it um, the X-rays don't go deep enough to really get all the way through the fetus once it's second, third trimester. So it's really more in first trimester. Also, you don't have to worry about having a full bladder because you don't really need that um, acoustic window anymore. And then finally, your patient should be in the lithotomy position. That just means on their back with both knees and hips at 90 degrees. So just like any other like pelvic exam. Okay, now what can you look for? What do you expect to find? So in the first trimester, um, your kind of goal is to determine their pregnancy status. And the first go-to is a beta HCG test. And we learned an embryo, you know, a lot of this stuff. So it's kind of fun to connect it. Um, and there's two different ways to do this. One is a urine test. That's more qualitative. Is there a beta HCG in the urine? Yes or no. Um, and then there's the blood test, which is more quantitative. And it gives you a specific number. And then based on that number, you can kind of use the correct probe, whether it's transvaginal or transabdominal. Um, and then once you get a positive beta HCG test, then you can go on to ultrasound because you want to make sure that the pregnancy is inside the uterus. And we'll talk about if it's not in a second. Um, and then dating the pregnancy, and that's done by like measuring the size of the um, fetus and then measuring the heart rate. So, in order to confirm the uter intrauterine pregnancy, um, you're looking for at least two of these three things, gestational sac, yolk sac, and fetal pole. Um, I'll show you examples of those in the next couple slides. But basically, you need a gestational sac and a yolk sac or a fetal pole. So um, essentially, what happens is the fetal pole forms and kind of starts to take over that yolk sac and then um, eventually yolk sac disappears. So as long as you have one of those inside the gestational sac, it's, it's a positive intrauterine pregnancy. Um, and then something else to note is the transabdominal views show like these results seven to 10 days later than transvaginal. So on transvaginal, you'll see the gestational sac usually with like about week four um, and then yolk sac week five, fetal pole week six. And then the transabdominal is going to be a little bit like a week or a little more delayed. So gestational sac, it's just oval anechoic structure. And then you have that like um, 
hyperechoic ring around it. And it's also eccentrically located, that's a big word, um, <laughs> but it's not in the middle because when the fetus or the, um, I, embryos is rough. Anyway, when it implants, it's gonna be not in like the middle of the uterus, obviously it has to implant in the wall. So it's gonna be like off-center. Something to um, note is something called a pseudogestational sac. And that's basically when there's something that looks like a gestational sac, but it's fluid in the uterus. And um, that is a little bit different. Um, it's not usually this oval shape that you get here. And it's usually more centrally located because that's kind of where the fluid is gonna go. And this pseudogestational sac is why you need to make sure that you have not just a gestational sac, but also either the yolk sac or the fetal pole before you can confirm the intrauterine pregnancy. Okay, so now yolk sac. Um, the yolk sac is within the gestational sac and it's basically just like that um, hyperechoic little ring. It still has fluid on the inside, so it's still dark anechoic on the inside. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the yolk sac. And then the fetal pole. The fetal pole grows between the yolk sac and the, um, the wall, I guess, of the gestational sac. And this is what actually turns into the baby. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, it enlarges and eventually the yolk sac regresses. And so it kind of takes that over. And that happens between 10 and 14 weeks. Um, everyone's a little different. And then this, since this is what actually becomes baby, this is of course, you know, where the heart is gonna develop. And so you have to be able to see this fetal pole to measure the fetal heart rate. And um, that usually, this usually shows up around six weeks on transvaginal. Okay, something else to look out for um, when you're doing this is twins. So you can see that there's two fetal poles here, which is pretty cool. I guess I should say multiple pregnancies because you could have more than just two. Um, but okay, so now measurements that we're gonna use to date the baby um, to figure out how far along mom is. The mean sac diameter is just what it sounds like. It's an average of the height, length, and width. So you just add them together, divide them by three, and then you add 30 to that, and you get the gestational, gestational age in days. And then the most like gold standard of dating the baby is the crown rump length, which is what it sounds like, the crown to the rump, the head to the butt. Um, and you want to just get a good image of that on your ultrasound and then freeze it, and then you can use the calipers to measure that. And then you add it to 42, and that's how you get your gestational age from the crown rump length. To measure the fetal heart rate, it's like a little bit more in depth, and um, Dr. Den did a great job explaining it in the videos, so you can watch that. But basically, you're using M mode and the OB setting. The OB setting is really helpful to, on good machines, I should say, to like help you kind of calculate a lot of this stuff. Okay, so that was first trimester, second and third trimesters, and we kind of talked about an embryo how um, first trimester is when a lot of you know like the main development stuff that we've covered happens. And then second and third is a lot more of just the growth. Um, there's five kind of things that you're looking at during these later ultrasounds. It has to send to the birth, both birth canal. So it can either be cephalic or breech. Um, it, cephalic means head first, breech is feet first. You can see on this ultrasound in the picture that the indicator is on the left. And since we always have indicator toward the head, we can know that the left side is the head. Therefore, the right side is more the cervix side and the head is first. So this baby is cephalic. Um, that is ideal. <laughs> that is how they come out best. And then two, the second thing you look at is the location of the placenta. Um, this is really looking for placenta previa, which we'll cover in the pathology section. And then measuring the fetal heart rate, it's again done very similar with the M mode. Um, it's just a little bit easier now because the heart is bigger, so it's easier to find. And it's usually a pretty high heart rate um, between 120 and 180, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then you're also looking at the amount of amniotic fluid. The way to do that is to measure from like the surface to the lowest point. Well, it's not the surface of the skin, but like the top of the amniotic sac to the lowest point. And you want it, that to be usually between um, two and eight centimeters 
If it's not, again, we'll get to that. Um, and then dating the pregnancy. So at this point, usually you have an idea of how far along the pregnancy is, but um, it's important to look at your measurements and make sure that the baby's progressing and kind of on track with normal stuff. Okay, so those size measurements that we do use um, by parietal diameter. So it's basically the diameter at the widest part of the skull, usually about the level of the thalamus. Um, and it's from the outside of the proximal parietal bone to the inside of the distal parietal bone, um, kind of nuances, but I thought that was interesting. And then head circumference, just what it sounds like. And that's just gonna be the circumference of the skull um, at that same spot that used for the biparietal diameter. So it's about the level of the thalamus. And then you can also look at femur length where you're measuring um, what it sounds like. The part that's actually like the ossified femur and then the um, abdominal circumference is the last thing. Again, just what it sounds like around the skin um, at the level of the stomach, umbilical, umbilical vein, and portal sinus. Okay, so now pathologies. Miscarriage or abortion. Um, this is really hard to like show because it's kind of a video. And I personally am not good enough at like technology to, you know, have it all playing. Anyway, um, so, but what this this case was, was essentially like no cardiac movement disc, like seen anymore and um, a decreased size of the, the fetus because that there was like cell lysis, there was disintegration, loss of fluid and, and just, you know, this, the baby was no longer growing. This is what's called a missed miscarriage um, where the fetus dies when it's inside the uterus, um, but it doesn't get like, expelled from the body as it does in some other miscarriages. Um, usually these present asymptomatic and are just found on like normal checkup scans and they are very, very sad, very traumatic. Um, this specific case that I found though, she had cramping and bleeding. So it, um, it might not have been missed for too much longer. Um, I don't really know too much though. Okay, so now ectopic pregnancies. So ultrasound is not great at being able to find, to like look at every single part of the female reproductive tract and every part of the abdomen looking for an ectopic pregnancy. So you can't always visualize it. Um, sometimes you have to kind of do it by ruling out, or I guess ruling in that there's a pregnancy and ruling out that it's in the uterus. And so if there's that high level of beta HCG, but there's no intrauterine pregnancy, it can kind of be assumed that there's a pregnancy somewhere else. Um, if you can visualize it, so on the right are three pictures where you can. The top one, you can see that, that um, the baby is below the uterus, more in the cervix, so that's gonna be ectopic. And then um, the middle one is an example of a tubal ring sign, which you can see the, the gestational sac in the middle and then like that thick tube-like layer, and that's just a thickened fallopian tube. So that is a ectopic pregnancy of the fallopian tubes. And then the bottom is the ring of fire sign. And that's from the Keller Doppler. Um, it surrounds the gestation. This one is not quite as good because a lot or like some of the other pathologies um, can also present with this, but this is uh, present in ectopic pregnancies. And then finally, if your ectopic pregnancy is ruptured, then there's gonna be free abdominal fluid, which we should all be great at being able to find now. Okay, finally, just a couple other pathologies we'll run through. Polyhydraminose is when there's too much amniotic fluid. So remember I was talking about measuring that vertical pocket of amniotic fluid. If it's more than eight centimeters, then that's too much. So it's polyhydraminose. And then oligohydraminose is when there's too little amniotic fluid. Um, and so that maximal vert vertical pocket is below two centimeters. Placenta previa, also we kind of like touched on this. Um, that's when the placenta is implanted over the cervix. So you can see in that top right picture where it's kind of over the, the cervix, it's considered high risk because there is like a big, big risk of hemorrhage for a mom. Um, and so, yeah, that's a high risk pregnancy. And then finally, placental abruption, which um, is where usually trauma or injury of some sort causes the placenta to like separate or rip. Um, and 
it usually like starves, starves the baby because there's no longer a connection for blood and nutrients and everything. But the thing is, there's low sensitivity for this on ultrasound. It's kind of can be tricky to see. Um, so it's not necessarily like the most commonly found pathology. And yeah, like I said, my references are pretty much the Pocus 101 course and then um, a little bit about miscarriage or missed miscarriages. So thank you.